مرحبا واهلا وسهلا فيكم بحلقه جديده من زغاريد ضيفي لليوم المؤلف الارجنتيني دانييل تيروجي مدير مركز الابحاث الموسيقي بباريس لفتره 20 سنه الجروب دو ريشيرش ميوزيكال من 97 لل 2017 اليوم حاحاوروا عن مجموعه من المواضيع باللغه الانجليزيه حنحكي فيها عن تطور موسيقى الالكترونيه وفعليا ما هي الصوت دانييل تيروجي Thank you for having me today. With the evolution of electronic music and the apparition of this genre in the second half of the 20th century, have we come to perceive the phenomenon of music somewhat differently? I don't think so at all. Uh, yes, music has changed radically, but not the perception of music. And of course, listeners have had to get accustomed to other ways of accepting musical sounds. The musical sounds was a very limited amount of sounds that were used in music, and they were not uh, mixed up with other sounds. A piano sound is a piano sound. Mm. And you don't close the door and you listen to a piano sound. And so all of a sudden, there were new sounds that were coming in, not at the second half, already in the first half, and at the end of the 19th century, Composers were adding new sound resources, all within an instrumental uh, background. And then with the apparition of electricity, the, there was a new domain there open to be used. And composers jumped on that and started using other kinds of sounds to compose their music. So it, it was uh, there's uh, one side, the the eagerness of composers to expand the musical or the sound palette of the music. And then on the other so side, you have to <laughs> convince listeners to accept that new palette as being musical. There is a fundamental attachment to the medium of sound production. There is an attachment to instruments, to the tradition of writing for an instrument and evolving its capacity of production of sound. There's always existed a kind of music that we call popular, and another kind of music which we call not popular. <laughs> and you can put classical music in here. Mm. I mean, classical music as it is consumed today or in the last century, uh, maybe in other times, there was a lesser dis difference, but I don't think so. So, the popular music, which can be uh, as beautiful as all the rest, is uh, first has a high level of acceptance between the listeners. Second, is highly repetitive, and I'm not speaking of techno. And third, is often associated to movement, to the body, mm. to body responses. And the music that is not popular is often based on a more contemplative approach to listening. So I listen, I, I sit and I listen to something which may be longer, which is less repetitive, which is more complex. That's the word. If I write a book on philosophy, good book, how many volumes can you expect to sell? 500? 1,000? 2,000? But at the same time, if I write a very uh, a novel, a love novel, or a uh, police novel, I may have a great success. What's the difference? It's a complexity. There, there, are, there are two extremes. Extreme simplicity and extreme compl uh, complexity. Extreme simplicity is when I talk nonsense. I, you, do, yes, I, o, yes, no, why, no, yeah. Say, I'm saying words, but they make no sense. It's too simple. 
And an extreme degree of complexity is when I will talk a lot and I will repeat very few words. Mm. And that's what the philosophy book is about. Okay, you, 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 you lead a paragraph and they, all the words are different. And the, the, the different levels go from less complexity, more repetition, less complexity, more repetition, onto a flat uh, level of information. We're speaking of what is called levels of information. But that is a very, very dangerous assumption, I feel sometimes, when regarding contemporary music, or that label that we put on uh, that music that huh? is formed by quote-unquote complex sounds and complex form and complex design. That is that one can infer deeper levels of information from something that is apparently complex just because it looks complex, that it must contain deeper levels of information. Anyway, I don't know if the music has levels of information. I'm comparing it to text, not to music. Sure. And, and uh, I, I can, yes, say that music has different levels of complexity. And what I mean is that there's music which is intuitively more easy to listen than others. And it's not a, and it's, it's, it depends on the music itself, and it depends on the individual itself. Many people will, will hate classical music. They say it makes no sense even the Mozart or whatever. Many people... Uh, do you think so? Like, Do you think that many people can look at a Beethoven symphony and say uh, it is very complex or makes no sense in the same way that they can speak of a Zenaki's piece? They put them in the same bracket. Oh, they put it in the same. In the same. In the same. I, I remember th 30 years ago, I, <laughs> we used to have an exam in the Conservatoire in which we would make the students listen to 30 different works. Mm. And they had to say who was the composer if they could, and the work if they could, identification of them. Yeah. There was a guy, all there was jazz, rock, and everything. He would say, this is this work by this group, and this year, etc., etc. Mozart, musique contemporaine. Senaki's musique contemporaine, of course. Bach, musique contemporaine. <laughs> Ask young people what they think of a symphony of Beethoven. So they, and then there are other problems arising with that. Then you have aesthetical models. You have aesthetical models. You think that the, the Fifth Symphony is wonderful. Okay, it's an aesthetical model. I don't know if it is wonderful. I don't know if it is wonderful in itself or it's the communication and evolution of communication we have has made it wonderful for our aesthetical models. It's, it's a very large and open question. But this is saying that an, a work of art in and by itself does not contain value. It only contains something that can be communicable. And what is communicable in a societal setting uh, hits people in a certain way that makes it of value and makes it profound. Mm -hmm. Sure. But uh, this view, I would agree with, if I were to have an opinion in this, if it was true in some areas and not true in some others. In the sense that if a Beethoven symphony is only great in Vienna, or is only great in Germany, or is only great in Europe, but not in South America or the Middle East, then, okay, this view could uh, have uh, some validity in my eyes, but when it's in the majority of cases worldwide, a work that is venerated, then how do you explain its potence? I explain it through repetition. We have uh, chosen, or the society has by some way chosen works that seemed more interesting, maybe, mm. and they have repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, to a point that we have developed a perception scheme mm. 
that makes us think, and I, I, I think it's wonderful also. I'm not saying it's not wonderful. My, what I'm saying is it could have been something else. With some other composer. It could have been other works. When people speak of Mozart, oh, okay. But Mozart for me is a cultural, as Beethoven and all, a cultural constructions that lead to an aesthetic perception uh, pattern that tell us that, yes, absolutely, they are perfect. And these people were venerated as craftsmen uh, of their field and to this day are considered great artists by... Craftsmen? Craftsmen, don't you see the composer? Yeah, I, see, I, see, I know perfectly what it means, but they were considered as... But that was not what made them famous, not, not sure. the craftsmanship. Because the craftsmanship was very good, and is very good, even today. I mean, there's no craft problem. <laughs> you don't think so? Oh, no, no, no. Even I, I think that today's young composers have a, a higher craftsmanship than I ever had, or many people in my generation had, because they were confronted with many different and new things, which we weren't. We had to acquire and learn. And, and what do they lack? today then? Because they seem to struggle. Yeah, but they, what do they want? They want to be able to live their uh, let's say adolescent dream of becoming a successful composer living successful through their Successful means earning money? From their work. From their work, okay. And being appreciated for that. Well, that, that, that's more, that seems more sensible sensitive to be appreciated. But uh, which composers earn money with music? In the electroacoustic, in the contemporary domain, nobody earns money. Yeah, there are a couple of names that may for some years have a certain, then they have elevated boulets to a very high pedestal. And, and so, okay, it's, it's, it's fine. But it's, I mean, most of the composers don't have a kopeck, as we say. But when you look at, when you look at uh, the generation of composers after the Second World War, uh, there are uh, a good number of names that we can cite that have had pretty good careers. Um, okay, they were better than the rest, maybe, or they were more elaborate, or they have more distinctive ideas. Uh, there is just a criticism of that era and the generation that followed that uh, these composers of the 60s, 70s, until the 80s have benefited from a social presence, a social uh, gravitas of the role of the composer in the media and in the diffusion platforms uh, <coughs> and have taken advantage of those resources without inciting more people to listen to this kind of approach towards sound. And this had led us to a generation of the 90s and the 2000s where the role and the uh, figure of the composer it becomes something completely dystopian to the layman. You can think what you want. <laughs> but you, you, in order to, to analyze, you have to analyze the context, mm. not, 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 not your vision of what, it, what has happened. I said before, there was an opportunity after the war. The world had to change. There were a lot of new composers who had a lot of good ideas. All the great names that we know. They were kind of pioneers in their domain. They exploited different ways of thinking, of acting. They were also uh, very... Uh, they had a... They worked a lot on their own promotion. There was the development of radio. There was the development of television. Radio, all of a sudden, made a leap in quality when it went from mono to stereo in the 60s. There was an interest in, in music, and the interest increased from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and it stopped the beginning of the 90s, the interest in contemporary music started going down. 
Mm -hmm. There were less concerts, less people in the concerts, less interest, less radio, less, less, less things. At the same time, there's something totally new growing, which is our internet. The 90s, nobody knew a lot about it, but it was already there. And then we, we analyze what is happening today in a world that's totally different. There are no concerts. Yes, Irkam will make next month his festival. GRM will make a festival. But there were 10 times, 20 times more concerts. And there was an audience. The way of listening has changed. First of all, I don't have time to listen. So I put uh, Teruji music after two minutes to say, okay, I know what it is. Even if the work lasts 20 minutes. Then going to a concert. Why should I go to a concert? I go to a concert when there's a real something that's worth it. Mm. Not going to a concert to discover what is happening in the world of creation. And this was an idea very active in the 80s. And in the 80s, for example, in France, there was an explosion of musical centers. All of a sudden, the Ministry of Culture started financing. So there were research centers everywhere. There are only three or four of them left today who struggle to live. But mainly the way of consuming music has changed. Why would I go to a concert if I can listen to it on the internet? People will say that going to a concert offers you something different, a right of some sort. Of course. I totally agree. But then you ask the question, why would I go? Because a, you, you see the validity in the... No, I, not, I mean, it's, it's so easy to stay at home. Hmm. Before, you had to go out to be in touch with things. The, the television would not uh, play a lot of music or theater and concerts and television are really boring. Uh, and, but now I don't need, um, I have all, all in my place. I'm in contact with the world mm. and I have to go out, dress, take the metro, then go there, pay, wait, make a queue. said, no, no, I don't have time for that. I don't have the energy. So it's hopeless. Uh, for me, it's hopeless. Yes, 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 yes. How many people who love your fifth symphony of Beethoven have never heard it in their lives? I mean, in, in vivo real in a concert. Uh, maybe many, yes. Many, 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 many. But this then is hopeless for whom? It is hopeless for the concert venues or is it even hopeless for those who wish to write music? Once again, nobody uh, uh, prevents you from writing music. The problem is what, <laughs> you, want, what you want to do with it. If your idea is, and if your your vision is Okay, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, composers could make quite a living with the music. Yes, some composers could, many couldn't. But if we compare the 80s with today, there are 10 times more composers, or people who want to compose, I don't know if they're composers, they want to compose. And the diffusion channels are what they are. There are a few concepts. And they go online, and the internet doesn't pay anything or almost anything. So, but, uh, okay, probably the most interesting thing you proposed was, uh, I want to be recognized as a composer. Okay. You compose your music, you play it to your friends, then you go to a concert and you present it in a concert every now and then. You do your website, you put it in Bandcamp, you put it in... And, uh, sound machine, etc., etc. Then you get to be a little. Then somebody says, "Okay, what's a great music? This is okay. Let's let's listen to it and tell the people buy it and and take." From the nineties onward, there was a decay in interest by audiences about contemporary music. Up to then, it was presented as something that everybody needed to access. Everybody, I mean, the cultural world needed yeah. to access. And when the interest in this music started to decay, uh, one of the uh, largest sources of financing for composers, which was the radio, started lowering the amount of 
music they would uh, broadcast every week. I, I, the, in, there were times in which a radio like France Culture would have nine hours of music per week. Zero today. So you see, little by little, there was a, a decay, less money for institutions, less money for concerts, productions becoming more and more expensive. So the the the, the idea of, of uh, making a living out of music has become more and more progressively unpos impossible. So if this is the case, <clears throat> yeah. this is the case, and I do not doubt that it is not very far off of being the case, don't you think there is some kind of criminal responsibility on institutions that teach people and incite people to come and study this? as being some kind of a future uh, job that they could have, where they come and tell I, I you, come and... I would tend to say that that's your problem, not the institution's problem. In the sense where I choose to go there. Uh, you, uh, no, yes, yeah, of course you choose to go there, but wh what are you expecting from going there? You're expecting to get a very high uh, tr level of training that will permit you to become very famous. That's probably what you're thinking, and, and it's not the the sense of a teaching system. The teaching system is there to organize your head. The teaching system there is not precisely and not quite. I do not think so. Okay, partly sure. It is the maybe no uh, noble and yeah deeper cause for why we go and study. But institutions are meant to deliver workforce for tomorrow's market and tomorrow's job market. For some. Okay, there's always a percentage that fails, but a better institution uh, means that a higher number of its graduates are going to find jobs in the future. Uh, a lesser institution is that one that has a small percentage that actually goes and works with the diploma, quote-unquote, that they have. Although we know, okay, that you do not, by getting a diploma, become a composer. <clears throat> that we are uh, on the same grounds uh, together. But you see, there's a, a plethora today of musical institutions. There's a plethora of everything. And uh, first of all, institutions... I'm not speaking only of music, but of universities, for example. Their problem is not how many uh, students that have finished their studies find a work afterwards. That's not their problem. Their problem is how many students they have, how many students make a PhD, what's the level of the PhD, mm. how many prizes do they get, how many uh, different issues they, they got. And uh, even if it were the case, when you have uh, thousands of uh, young people that want to study literature, yeah. from the beginning, you know there are not enough jobs for all those people. Yeah. But that's, that's you, you, in some countries, this has existed, huh? the numerus clausus, meaning that only you can have... Uh, a certain amount of students because the, the possib job possibilities are these. Yeah. But you create a very high level of frustration among young people. Sure. So let's say, and that, that's a very capitalistic way of thinking, it's a global fight. Okay, you can all study literature, you can all study May the best com win. composition, and then it's your, your problem afterwards to, to, to get a job. See, I, I never thought that the conservative was going to open me a road to something. Maybe I thought at the beginning, you know, that, uh, well, if, if I had this this title, but if there's some place in the world where titles don't count at all, it's in music. Nobody cares you come from the Conservatoire de Paris or from La Haye. It cares if, yes, if you want to have a job in a conservatory, then there will count. But as a, but as a musician, it doesn't count at all, and, and I think it's a very good thing. Absolutely, absolutely. But let's go back to the idea of a teaching institution. The teaching institution doesn't teach you anything. <laughs> it organizes your head. Mm. 
That, that's, that's the Yavne. That's the Yavne. It's not to know. We, we often think that in, in a, a high level institution, what it gives you is knowledge. It gives you some knowledge, of course, gives you experience, but it organizes a way how to, how to think. I, I for, when I was uh, 47 years old, yes, you know, 46, I finished a PhD in the university. It, it was very difficult to do it because I was composing, I was directing, I was doing many, many, many things. But uh, I will never regret the intellectual experience of sitting down and writing 400 pages. What does that mean? How does it organize your mind, your methods and everything? And that's what the teaching brings. And you may not be interested at all in contemporary music. Doesn't mean that Studying contemporary music is not a good thing. Uh, it will help you think and it will help you understand. I music agree. is made of understanding and music is made of listening. And one of the things we musicians have to do is listen to music. I was in a privileged position for years of listening to hundreds of music. Sometimes I was really, uh, I wasn't happy with that. Because when you're a composer, you don't want to get distracted. But the, my job obliged me to listen to music. And then you open your mind, you open your mind, and you, you, you learn how to listen. So do you think that becoming a composer today is a doomed quest? No, it's not a doomed quest. Some succeed, some don't. And this is the nature of it. I think it has always been the nature yeah, of it. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, and, and neither Boulez nor Berio nor, nor Messiaen were the only students in their course. Absolutely. There were many other. There was a very nice article some three or four years ago. About, they gave the name of 240 composers alive. No, alive or dead? No, alive in France, which were never played. <laughs> okay. Huh? That's a it gives, it gives you an indicator, and the same thing one may say with the music of the past, because there is a revolt. There is a revolt amongst uh, young. Composers. I'm happy with that. I'm very happy uh, that of is. the outcome of the status of music today, uh, and the language models, if one should say, or the aesthetic models that were inherited from the 80s and the 90s, that some and maybe. I could cite myself amongst those people, but I don't want to include myself in the conversation. Uh, some would think as being uh, reasons for the de deterioration of appreciation of the contemporary music uh, medium. And there is a willingness to reinvent something. Perfect. Uh, that is more in tune to the world. I don't say anything else. I to totally agree. Um, I've, I have a, li a little... Uh, I'm not so happy to say that it was the past who has brought the problems of today. It was their fault. Was there a fault? Uh, what I think is what you last said, that you had to reinvent continuously the model. The model, as I said, it dis disintegrated. And the new model, and many people thought it was going to be a good model, a wide diffusion through internet didn't work didn't work because the kind of music I do can have a certain number of followers but not a million and only there I could start winning earning some money and we are lucky that today the radio every now and then plays some of your music and you can get some musical rights when you do music for other cinema or theater, and somebody pays you something, but and 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 there is also a common discussion going on about the the fact that composers are probably the most the artists that get less money in the artistic world. So th we need new initiatives. And I, I don't know. I don't know if it's, it's not to me to imagine them. That's why I'm, it's good if there's a revolt and people are not happy with what is happening now. I'm not happy either. It is very difficult to 
to continue a conversation on those grounds <clears throat> more precisely because there is an ingrained thought in the fabric of a composer's mind where music should be displayed on a stage, there should be people. And I am saying something, like I, I go talk to people who are writing pieces for strange instrumentation. Uh, let's say... Uh, viola percussion. <laughs> viola percussion, okay. <laughs> now, and they expect people and electronics. <laughs> and this could be a piece that goes on for five minutes. Eleven. This, uh, this, could, this could go for ten minutes, let's say. But if given the opportunity, they will not hesitate to transform this piece into a 30-minute piece still expecting people to listen to it for 30 minutes. I, I don't agree. I understand what you say. You know, it's coherent, but because I've seen the, 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 the inverse process happening. In the 70s, the 80s, works were very long. 20, 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. You would go to a concert, you, you, you would almost die. And then that's a good thing about uh, the digital uh, production is that there was the possibility of working with more detail, with time, and works sh shrinked. Today, works that exceed 20 minutes are not so many. They tend to be 10, 12, 13, sometimes 8. Even that is long. For Because the, 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 the market has imposed... At a time standard of three minutes. Yes. And when it goes after three minutes, it's okay, it's too long. But there were works of three minutes and two minutes, and there were works of four minutes 200 years ago, and nobody said a thing. Like when, when, when Chopin writes Etude de Concert, and the longest Etude is three minutes or four yeah, minutes. They long. don't play only one. Okay, they, they play, play a 12. series. But, no. you know, but you know that the activity, you know that the phenomenon, you know that the event is happening inside... A specific time frame and it ends after three minutes and you can take a breath there are composers that write works in movement also today two minutes three minutes now how do you think audiences come to accept new sounds and maybe this can lead us towards the topic of the rise of electronic music and electronic based sounds be it recorded sounds or be it uh, let's say, synthetically generated uh, sounds. Yeah, but first of all, uh, listening to music is not listening to sounds. <laughs> of course, uh, music is made of sounds. But uh, first of all, music is music. I mean, it's a language. It's, it's a way of combining s sounds to make a sense. And listeners are more interested in the sense of music than in the sound of music. And so it's easy to introduce new sounds. Yeah. There, will, there won't be, there probably be very few critics about that. It's when absolutely, when you change the domain as with the musique concrète or with electronic music, there, there can be some kind of a prize. But uh, listeners want music. But don't you see new sounds sometimes as obstacle to sense making for the audience? That's the role of the composer. It works or it doesn't work. Sure. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. I don't know what, any example of music with new sounds that didn't work, but I know many electronic works that don't work. But it's not because of the sounds, it's because the way the sounds are combined, which doesn't transmit something to the listener. You bring up the concept of music being a language. Yeah. There would be many people who wouldn't be aligned with this view. Absolutely. absolutely. Since language should be something that transmits, uh, you know, distinct meaning. Absolutely. No, no, I totally agree. When I was using the word, I said, no, that's not a good word. It's not a language. But why is it that we tend to you juxtapose music and language and using them both in the same sentence, do you think? Because <laughs> the good thing is that, well, as you said, language is used to transmit information. Music is not used to transmit information. What is it used for? 
uh, well, we don't know. It trans music transmits music. And so they, 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 there's not a, uh, a concept, an idea that's being transmitted. When I say, this is a nice day, you understand what I'm saying and what I'm meaning. But when I make you listen to the music, you understand something, I understand something else, he understands something else. So it, it's, it's, it's an open interpretation of a certain alignment of signs, let's say, to get in more of the semiological approach to music. And uh, there has been, and Levi Strauss was one of the people, but not the only one who worked on that, the idea of what they call the double articulation. Okay. It's that in a language, you have a certain number of phonemes, and then you can combine them in different ways through a certain number of rules. Okay, there are some phonemes that are never together, others okay. that are always together. And so, Schaeffer would say that music was the same thing. So it's based on this juxtaposition no, not, of not, 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 not uh, Schaeffer, the, the semiology. That, that uh, the music had notes, mm -hmm. and then there were rules that guided the way those notes were combined. Okay. And Schaeffer, in a certain way, wanted musique concrète to be like that. Say, you say, he would say there are the sound objects, and then we need rules to combine them. Now, and uh, this this was a wrong thought. I will tell you why. Let us let us develop this thought uh, after maybe we introduce maybe in a more uh, simple way to our audiences two concepts that you've used uh, here: that of musique concrète, that being what and. Uh, sound objects, and, and altogether a topic that needs development. It, it comes all from the same idea. <clears throat> so, if we keep this idea that in music you have notes, and then you have rules that more or less control the way those notes are organized, uh, Schaeffer thought that there should be some kind of equivalent of notes in musique concrète and that uh, sounds, the different sounds, were like the construction blocks of music concrète. And these constructing blocks, he called them music, uh, sound objects. And for him, a sound object could be anything. It's, it's not an object that produces sound. Huh? Okay. It's a sound object is some sound that is Recorded, recorded, yeah. <clears throat> and then you listen to it, and it has a certain form and development and end. And that's the sound. It's like a brick, it has a form. So it is not the Berlioz definition of an instrument is any object that produces sound, where uh, the rather than it being a sound that is recorded and perceived under the lens of the recording medium, that is a yeah. sound object. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then he even pushed this definition to a higher level when he started talking of musical objects. Mm. And these were, for him, the sound objects that were good for making music. So that was his first level approach. Okay, we need to have, it was more theoretical than practical. And then the second level, we need, once we have the sound objects, we need rules to control their combination. And uh, he even, made himself. He he has a series of works in, in 1958 called the Etude aux Objets, Study on Objects, Study on Movement. Uh, and with the, these studies, he tried to convince, let's say, the composers of that day that they would, there could be these two articulations. You talk about, about a fundamental mistake where he was wrong. Yeah. Yeah, there, were, there was a mistake in his appreciation because uh, one interesting thing with musical instrumental sounds is that they are already known by you and me. Okay. And they are quite well known 
by both you and me. And so I, I am not surprised when I listen to a violin or a clarinet or a piano. I may be surprised in the way the sounds combine themselves, mm -hmm. but not the sound itself. This is how you can make a series of rules, like the tonal system, in which you can uh, articulate sounds based on a certain number of principles. But the difference with sound objects is that sound objects are not known to everybody, and they may have their own logic. Okay, what do you mean by logic? I mean they have a behavior that's totally different from other sounds, or can be similar to other sounds, or can be different. Mm. I mean, you never know beforehand how they're going to be. This is to say that when you start working with sounds, you record sounds, you transform them, you make electronic sounds, a lot of what you do is based on the listening of those sounds and understanding their capacities of combination with other sounds and then trying to fix them together in structures that are perceived already by the composer as being musical. Mm. Then the listener, it's his problem <laughs> to decide if it's music or not. But if I'm a composer and you're the listener, we share one thing, music. We know how to listen to music. We cannot explain it. We know how we like music. There are people that can't listen to music, but most of the people can listen to music. They, they, uh, let, let's use this word which has a double meaning, which is uh, they understand music, they appreciate music, they like music, they love music. So that we share. Then when I compose music, I'm using all that musical capacity to make the music I want to make. And then I propose it to you as a listener, and you accept it or not. And you will say, I don't understand your music. Or you may be even aggressive. I don't like your music at all. Or this is not music. Because it doesn't correspond to your idea of what music should be. So going back to, to Schaeffer, he, he wanted to develop a kind of uh, knowledge and thinking system for composers to use. Isn't that a noble cause? It is a noble cause, but it's destined to, to, to fail because of sounds themselves. <laughs> let, me, let me interject here before we continue on the Schaeffer subject, and that is about the idea of building a system. Because, okay, perhaps a system is beneficial to the person using it, the composer. It maybe facilitates the task of crafting uh, sounds together, but isn't it also a medium for the listener also to engage in the experience of listening? Maybe 150 years ago. <laughs> I mean, how much uh, changed then? Uh, they're, they're different. So there used to be something that everybody thought was universal, at least in Europe. I'm speaking of Europe, of course which was the tonal system, who, developly, who, slows very, who develops very slowly since the 16th century until the end of the 19th century. There's the thought that it's like a continuous line. It's not a continuous line already. There are really different jumps. You cannot compare the last works of Liszt with Gluck. I mean, there, there, there's, there's a universe of difference. There are some common trends. That's a, the, the, the good thing. Then comes the 20th century. And for the first time, somebody, Arnold Schoenberg, that it's not that he questions the total system. He tries to find a way around it. But the total system was already completely change and not tonal at all. So it was that the task was not difficult in itself. What was difficult is to imagine a new system. He used the word emancipation. Emancipation, yes. I am. He thought he was trapped in something, in a way of thinking, and it, it was true, in a way of thinking that uh, 
this this meant that he he had to be radical to change. Thus, he invented invented a system with its own logic also. Always based on the same sounds. The sounds were the same. Huh? They were not different. Mm. What were different were the rules. Right. He invented this for himself, but he was very ambitious, and so he yes he was. He said uh, uh, that uh, I, I read uh, some months ago uh, once again his treaty on harmony mm. and I was surprised of how how well. It's not the discuss the topic of no that. go on, uh, go no, on. no 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 it will take us very far away, but uh, so other composers were interested in this system and uh, started working on it, uh, with it first of all and on it afterwards, trying to make it more efficient. Okay, and, and such as uh, whom, for example? No, and then we evolve slowly from uh, dodecaphonism to serialism, serialism. Okay. Uh, and then to integrated serialism. And every time there were some kind of rules that were uh, controlling the way ideas were organized, <clears throat> the listeners, they did what they could. Uh, because uh, dodecaphonism is a composition system, not a listening system. Tonal system is a composition and a listening system. I mean, it's already installed in our perception. Some people might go as far as to say that it is a natural system. Th that's, that's a great discussion of, of Schoenberg. He says there's no natural ar harmony. That all uh, intervals are harmonic, whatever they are. Mm. Uh, because at a certain point they're they're part of the you'll harmonic. find them in the series you, you'll find them so for him he has a very large opinion and then he says okay we shouldn't use these these three or four first ones we'll go with the higher ones but uh, it is very difficult today to listen to a music and say this is dodecaphonism uh, some, some some words are really uh, caricature <laughs> of dodecaphonism got in in a certain moment caricaturel. I mean it it uh, uh, well it was a, a bit unmusical from my point of view. But that's first. Then after that, after composers were imposing themselves rules and more rules, comes. An opening, an opening which has its influences in the States. The States has, has remained for many, many decades dodecaphonism. Yeah. Even today, it's a very strong way of, it has been apparated and, and, and then came other ideas like minimalism, and then came other ideas, look, I'm free to do what I want. And other ideas like uh, improvisation, mm -hmm. having composers uh, ask uh, performers to improvise, etc., etc. Third and, stream and whatnot. Uh, yeah, but what, what I mean, we arrived to a point, which is for me the point today, is that when I compose a work, I invent a system. And for the next work, I will invent another system. Do you see the danger in that? No. Depends, depends what are the limits of your system. But you are the only one who possesses the keys to the limits of that system. Uh, I don't possess the keys uh, to... Like self-imposed limits. I don't possess the keys of many music which I like. I don't know how they were made, what were their ideas, I don't know. But it, do you need the keys? That, that's what I'm, what I'm trying to get. That little by little, all these changes in, in structures, in thinking, have brought also a change in the way we, we listen, not me or you. The, the audience listens. They are more tolerant. They are more accustomed to strange things. I don't say that they accept always. But, and I don't think I need to know any system 
to listen to music. The difference with the total system is there was a common trend around a long time would make it l look like a unique perception system. But see, we, I come back to this, this psychological uh, feeling that you and I might have while listening to tonal music, that of the tension and resolution uh, and the inevitable demise of the tension towards an inevitable resolution. As And it is a feeling that resembles that of I, I go back to the term, that of the inevitable, that it is meant to go there, that there is something of a physical nature that guides it towards resolution. And the scary thing is that one might know and realize that it may only be a construct. Yeah, for me it's a construct. But it's a very powerful construct. It, I mean, you have centuries of that const construction be behind. But... Uh, the, 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 the idea, as you mentioned, which is uh, tension and resolution, they can happen otherwise than, than, uh, we, than, than through the total system. For example, when you came in, you saw the piano, the Sonata Beethoven, Opus 10, number 5, I think it is. Ping, ping, uh, ping. Okay. Why did I, I... I was playing it recently because uh, 50 years ago I had some lessons with a very strange guy who was in Argentina, who was an excellent professor, Francisco Kropfel. He was from Hungary. And he had a very radical way of analyzing music. He said that music was suspension and resolution, which we all agree. And that all music could be analyzed with ta ta u ta ta. Okay. Suspension, resolution. Priam, pa pim, pa pam, pa pam, pa pam, pa pam, pa. Suspension, and all in in the all the the jumps are resolutions, and he, I remember I don't remember the details, but he took all the sonata he analyzed it from the, this point of view, and of course there were the, there were other intermediate solutions like a ta ta ta, uh, 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 resolution and tension. You know? So you, you're right when you say that music is made of resolution and tensions. But it doesn't have to be a fifth chord followed by a, a tonic. And uh, for example, in one work, I end the work, and there's a, a fifth chord with the dominant uh, chord mm -hmm. in, in, with electronic sounds. Okay. And the resolution is a landscape. Tita, ti, landscape. And it works. <laughs> the landscape has no pitch. <laughs> I, but I, it's the idea of the resolution. It, it is resolved. It doesn't matter how it is resolved. I, am, I, I agree. I agree with you that uh, maybe this is a Schenkerian way of looking at uh, musical analysis where the, there's a vector that goes through a musical work of tensions and resolutions, and they can take whichever form they can Absolute. take. Absolute. Uh, the only difference is what we described in the beginning, that of the strangeness of a timbre that we are dealing with. Yeah. And this leads me to the question, does the dodecaphonism, and more precisely maybe the work of Anton Webern, lay some ground for the rise of electronic music? I don't think so. In the sense where I look at it from the perception of, okay, this is a new system of sound organization using the same uh, known mm -hmm. uh, sound resources, but through their new combinations arise new sound textures. Yes. And focus becomes more accentuated on the sound texture with the loss of formal perception, 
Yeah. What do you think? I, I, I think, first of all, that uh, there were several contributions in the first half of the 20th century, all of different nature. And there was Schoenberg, we talk, we tried to deconstruct, deconstruct the melodical world. There was Debussy, who deconstructed in this way the harmonic world. There was Stravinsky, who deconstructed the rhythmic world. And so this brings little changes mm -hmm. in composers' minds. And then you find uh, an incredible level of abstraction, let's call it like that, with Webern. An, an abstraction and economy. That, I think, is what uh, surprises most composers, probably in those days. And then comes this little guy, Pierre Schaeffer, working in the French radio. And his idea was not to say, OK, I will change the face of the world. No. He said, we have recordings. Why don't we use them? It's, we can have an orchestra with the instruments and then at a certain point play other sounds. How big of a mental leap is the uh, proposition of Pierre Schaeffer? Initially, it's not so big. Initially, it's not so big. However, he was very well immersed in the radio world. And that meaning that he knew the power of sound for the listening from a radio perspective and from a dramatic perspective, how you can make somebody uh, imagine things only through sounds. That's radio drama, mm -hmm. where people talk and discuss like in the theater. And then he the, was involved in that. Yeah, he did a lot of that from the beginning of the 40s. And he did a... Uh, he did a, a, a series uh, of, I think it's 12 episodes of a kind of science fiction uh, work and uh, where he uses any kind of sounds. And that led him to understand the power of sound, of recorded sound. Well, well it was the only way to have the sounds there, mm. to be recorded. But the sounds which you can't see how they can recall perfectly whatever you want to see. <laughs> right. And then he said, okay, let's start putting some of these sounds together. I have nothing else to do. I put sounds together. Oh, they sound nice. Let's continue. And what am I doing? I'm putting sounds together to create structures, which I call music. I'm making music. Music is that putting sounds together that make some sense to somebody, and I call that music. And that's how he started. Then he started to be understand the power of what he was doing, that it changed totally the way music was perceived, that all of a sudden the, the, the performers had no, could have no place to be in there. And, and the shock was there. It was not the sounds. But the lack of performers, mm. that was that was the strongest change. I come to a concert where there's nobody performing. He deconstructed the concert. He deconstructed, the, yeah, more the, the, the musical ritual, mm. the rite of music, the rite of spring, Stravinsky, the rite of music, was deconstructed by, by Schaeffer. That's why I, I explained the other day in a conference that in the first concert he made with the Symphonie pour un homme seul, he he was standing in the middle of the scene, moving some strange things to control sound, so that uh, the audience would understand that there's somebody really behind that. It's not an accident. Uh, this this is this is the magic of music. This is our image of music. There are people sitting on a stage. They have some strange objects in their hands, and then all of a sudden, they start making sounds, and it forms together something that makes sense, and I like, and I enjoy, and we call that music. How it works, I don't know. If it weren't a great mental leap for, from a composition standpoint, 
was the experiencing of sounds generated by loudspeakers something that was out of this world for, for people at the time? Uh, we must keep in mind that we're only five or six years after the Second World War, that uh, the shock is still there. Uh, and, and some years after is when people started knowing all that had happened. And there was a certain confidence in technology, that technology could help the world. That technology won the war. Technology won the war. Technology could help a new humanity mm. that wouldn't, with where wars wouldn't exist. This is an aparté, but uh, ten years later, in the sixties, it was totally the contrary. The idea of the atomic bomb that could destroy the world really obsessed many artists, many people. But well, now we, we're in the beginning of the fifties, and so a music based on technology was seen as something positive. There's an article in a journal after the first concert of Cifair saying the music of the future will have no performers nor conductor. And, and they propose it as a positive experience, not, not something uh, that, we, that is negative, that goes against. Mm. Huh? And the same thing happens in the 20th century with the internet. Internet is against. It's, 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 it's a leap in the future. I know. It's, it's a leap in, in something we don't know. So there's always fear around technology. But here, no. It came, came in quite well. And Schaeffer was a, a, a very uh, intelligent person and a very good communicator. So what did he do? He invited all the composers of those days. Come on, come on, come and do something. Stockhausen, Boulez, Messian, Soguet, Millot, Haubestan Ramati, uh, Earl Brown, etc., etc. They all came, had some experience, made some works, okay, I like it, I don't like it. And they had their experience there. And that, that's how he... Mr. Tanuji, I finished by a question that's yeah. uh, something... How are you today? Very well. Uh, how are you? Are you good? <laughs> yes, I'm good. And you? Okay. <laughs> and that is uh, regarding form. Yeah. Form. I I use a certain terminology that some people don't agree with, and that is recognizable and unrecognizable form. Uh, okay, everything has a form. Uh, every eventually. <laughs> every event. Every uh, yeah. music has a form, but there are some that we can recognize almost all of the topography of the form and those yeah. who have lesser recognizable form. Um, do you think that timbre, electroacoustic sounds, uh, new sound combinations play a role in the deterioration of the perception of form? First of all, uh, there's the intention of form and the perception of form. Let's say, uh, I write a fugue, I write a sonata. Uh, you have to be quite skilled as a listener to recognize the sonata form, even if it's classical or a fugue. Mm. But well, we agree that those are like uh, universal forms that can be perceived. And that was one of the great successes of tonal music, was the complexity of form. Yeah. And that you could imagine uh, that 32 sonatas of Beethoven, 32 different forms. Uh, my idea on form is that due to the, we didn't speak of that at all, the double uh, challenge of listening to electroacoustic music, which is listening to the sounds and listening how the sounds combine together to make music, implies a simplification of form. In electroacoustic music, forms tend to be very simple. And they can be very complex. Okay, they can be. But the, from a perception point of view, they won't be perceived. 
I can, I can ride a fugato, an electroacoustic fugato. Nobody will, will, will perceive. I've made this experience when I was younger. I don't make it anymore. Uh, but several times, and this is the following. I make a sequence of sound that have a certain way of behaving and this. It's, it's all the same sound. Then I say, okay, I will make two or three different sequences based on the same sounds, but with different articulations. And I put them together. It never worked. It always makes a mess. So I'm, I'm trying to apply old ideas to a new medium. And it's a very simple example. No, no, but uh, and, I but it, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Or that sometimes things that you don't imagine at all work. Uh, I would... Uh, there's one word that uh, contemporary music has brought, and, and electroacoustic particularly, is articulation. Is the art of changing, I would say. Okay. You're here, and the, you go somewhere else. Yeah. That's one of the greatest strong points of electroacoustic so? music. Is that it's, it's like in cinema. They made a change. You go from one situation to another, and you have an event maybe in the middle that makes you change. And so the the the, the formal aspect I think has taken another dimension. It's not the same as in the past. And in a certain way, I don't think I would uh, admire a work through its form because it has a beautiful form. I'm not sensitive to the beauty of form. Uh, I, I, I can play the Bach fugues, I can analyze them, understand, but most of it, do I like how it sounds? Or uh, I won't say I like the form. I like the way he, he evolves. Uh, of course, it's a consequence of the form, all you want, but not the form itself. So I think that the, uh, in the acoustic world, and particularly the acousmatic world, has created other ways of of of, of, of uh, organizing time in duration. More concretely? More concretely. For example, having uh, two totally different events happening at the same time. Such as? Uh, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's uh, having one sound in one register doing some kind of things and a totally different sound in another register or they're being crossing from in in, mm. in in pitch going up and going down and our ear is very sensitive to, to all these these changes this the another word that's used sometimes is polyphony what does polyphony mean in electroacoustics okay you have several sounds sounding together is that a polyphony no from a traditional definition of polyphony no that's what I wanted to do with my first example of polyphony, where things will interact among themselves. They don't interact at all. They crunch together in a, in a continuous bunch. So I, I, I think, uh, and once again, I, permit me to come to the beginning. Uh, the form cannot be, in electroacoustic music, a predefined form. The sound will guide the process. The sound will impose its rules. I don't know if it will guide. It will impose some rules mm -hmm. and will prevent you from doing things and may push you to do some other things. This is why it is very difficult to anticipate, to say, okay, I'm going to... I, I, when I write music for an instrument, I, I, I can imagine things. I, I, I Already, it's, it's very, not visual, but the sound comes alone. But now I have different sounds. I listen to them. How are they going to work together? I don't know. Do you think that in a hundred years' time we will have more control perceptually over, perceptively over those sounds and would be able to imagine form without being forced into an exercise? But the... the the main question is, why does form exist? Form exists as a way 
of organizing the duration of music. If I want to make a piece of 20 minutes, okay, I have to some, find some kind of structure yeah. behind it. Or not, because they are music of 20 minutes, and oh, then it stops and people clap and they go home, happy, probably, <laughs> because nothing happened. But from my point of view, and here where is where my education comes in, since I want to make, write works of a certain duration, I organize them in structures, which is not exactly a form. <laughs> But it has a certain, and so the, I would call that strategies of making time go by. Nice. Uh, so I, I, nice. I have, I have, for example, certain s strategies which are not formal; they are perceptual. The one strategy is I have a long work of twenty minutes, and in the first first three or four minutes, I present not in a very evident way, all the elements that will be in the work, different sounds. Yeah. So, when you get to them, you already have some acquaintance with them. Yeah. And so this, in a way, simplifies the perception. Plant the seeds. Exactly, exactly. Or, for example, I always have two or three things happening at the same time. And I may stop them, and that, that creates a, oh, uh, a strong articulation point. Yeah. And uh, a point as a, uh, who, who used to say that that they well, that's my, uh, a, a point that you will remember a landmark yeah huh? and a temporal uh, checkpoint exactly yeah. and classical music doesn't have many landmarks and acoustic music has a lot of landmarks I mean a strong moment that you remember also well used to say uh, that there has always, for him, there has always to be one moment in which you feel pain in your ear because it's so strong. And one moment, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice of him. Very nice of him. You can watch his episode uh, on my channel. Uh, Daniel Teruji, I thank you for the time that you have given me today. It was my pleasure. A, it's been a pleasure. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. And uh, I hope everybody listening had the chance to benefit from this condensed panorama. Thank you. Thank gave. you for your optimism.